Ryan Hoppy. The following thoughts on Hoppy Hour do not represent Cox Media Group or its sponsoring. Anything you hear may and will be used against you. Thank you. Call security! What's up? This is Hoppy Hour. I am your host, Ryan Hoppy, and I'm very pumped and I'm very happy about my next guest. So why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> it's Dominic from the Ask the Dom Show. Of course, official legal counsel for the Mike Calta Show. How's it going, man? We've been trying to do this for about a year and a half now, so it feels good to finally get this down. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, um, I, I, I feel bad because I don't want to blow you off you know, with my, my calendar and schedule and the timing of it all because uh, I've done some podcasts before, but I, I felt bad that you thought I was kind of dodging you, but I'm happy we had a chance to catch up, man. I feel like when we first kind of bonded and caught up was on the cruise, and it was like 1 in the morning, and I was drunk in the casino, and you were just kind of talking to me, and we talked for like a whole hour. And to me, that's like when me and you got to know each other. Because I would see you in the hall. I would see you whenever I've sat in on Kel at the show, and you would come in, and we'd shake hands. But to me, the cruise is kind of like when we got to talk a lot. Well, the cruise is great because, first of all, that's usually when you meet Drunk Dom. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and, and I and I tell people that you know, I'll talk to anybody and everybody on the cruise. You can ask me anything you want, and but I give one disclaimer: drunk, dumb. I'm not liable for the legal advice I give on the ship. So if you ask me a serious legal question, you might not get a serious legal yeah. answer. But you know, I'm there to relax, just like everybody else is. I'm there to unwind. My job is stressful. Uh, but I remember hanging out with you uh, a few times, and in particular the casino. The casino is my uh, is my playground. I, when I, you're in there, you play this like cartoon character. You become this different person. Once you leave the casino, you're back to being dumb. But once you're in there, it's like this inner character in you just comes out. That's predominantly when either I play poker or I'm at the craps table. Usually, the craps table I think is the 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 character interaction. And the reason why is if you've played craps, you want a hot table. Yeah. Uh, and, and in order to get a hot table, you got to get p- folks pumped up. And you want to get it loud. And you want to get a lot of energy. You want to get it exciting. And, and that was what we had at the last cruise when we had Bert and me oh and God. Joey Ralphie. and Spanish. And R- I don't think Ralphie was playing with us. He came out one night. He came out one night. But the, when, when Bert was rolling and oh, he yeah. had – the, the, the 30 minutes or 40 minutes, and we were so hot this table that the the dealer knocks the dice out of Bert's hands. And then, of course, Bert then rolls a seven, and the whole table goes crazy. That was the type of energy that I'm talking about you want in a casino. I was hanging out with Bert because that was like the fourth day in, and Bert's laid back. Bert's loud, but in like a very laid back way. But it was crazy how he went from being happy, everything's going well at the table, to then he's serious, and he was mad. It was crazy how he transitioned right after that incident. Well, we were all pissed. Oh, yeah. uh, I, I, you know, myself, Joey, I think Bert was probably deservingly more pissed because he was the shooter. And when you're the shooter and you're on a roll and the whole table's pumped up, you know, and no one's mad that he craps out because eventually it's going to happen. Yeah. All right. That, that is what it is. But, of course, the manner in which it, it would happen is they intentionally tried to ice the table. Oh, yeah. And I don't blame them for being mad. And, in fact, you know, we were compensated to some extent uh, by the casino uh, after all of that was sorted out with the uh, management staff there. Well, once P came in, P was like the uh, person that was able to convince the uh, boat to do some things. Because at first, they didn't really believe Burr, and they didn't really believe everybody. But once P came in, to me, he was sort of the negotiator that made things happen. Uh, You know, I... Pete was mad, but I don't think Pete was really mad. I, I think Pete was mad because what happened shouldn't have happened. And Pete knows that. And Pete's, you know, he, he knows how to gamble. He's been in the casino a lot. Bert, you know, Bert's yelling, you know, you know who I am. And, you know, we're, we're all drunk. And, you know, and then, and then Pete comes in with a Chicago Pete style, yeah. you know. So the, the fellas were right. It shouldn't have happened. And, you know, and now I'm. I'm aggravated, but now I have to step back because, all right, the guys are getting riled up. 
we still got, I think, two or three nights left on the ship at this point. Oh, yeah. You know, it's, um, I think it was, we were on for seven days, right? We did a seven-dayer. So, you know, I got to keep in mind that I need to watch what these guys are doing because I don't want us, A, thrown out of the casino because I, I don't I want to gamble. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to get us thrown off the boat, you know, or whatever. Not that these things would happen, but I have to, these things run through your mind as a lawyer. You seem like a guy where you observe a lot of things and you think about the different things that could happen if there was a consequence. You know what I mean? Well, unfortunately, that's what happens when you go to law school. You know, yeah. you, you, you're trained to you try to anticipate a variety of different things given the totality of the circumstances. And as a criminal defense attorney, as well as a personal injury attorney and a trial attorney at that, you have to think quickly on your feet. And you have to adjust given the ebb and flow of a situation or a circumstance. Uh, and that's why your head really has to be on a swivel. Uh, I have to you know, truly be careful in those scenarios because I'm there having a good time. You know, I'm usually drinking because they, they feed you drinks at the casino. You know, but you can't have, you know, you can't be the drunkest guy in the room and then also be representing folks. Yeah, and you have to watch how much you drink because once you get drinks in you, blacking out is the worst thing possible. And I made sure when I was on the cruise, there were nights I got very, very drunk, sleep for three hours and then go out and drink more once the morning began. But as a person, you always have to make sure that you don't black out because that's when the worst things happen. Well, you know, I was the president of my fraternity. Uh, I was an ATO, and I'm the same fraternity as Bert. Spanish has told me that there were some crazy memories that you should talk about now. Well, yeah. I, well, yeah. I mean, as the president of ATO, you know, and I was in my 20s, you know, that, that's you kind of do what you're supposed to do. You know, like, like you're young. You're in your 20s. When yeah. you get to your 40s, and I had my family with me on the cruise, you know, and I need to get up and get the kids for breakfast and stuff like that. I'm not blacking out on the ship. Yeah. But I'll tell you, there are many times I remember waking up in the front yard of the fraternity house with maybe a lady friend or two, maybe clothed or not. But that's the way it was back in the early 90s, you know, at UCF. What do you think of when you see these news uh, articles about the frat boys that are over drinking and dying or the frat boys that get into some major trouble? Do you ever look back? And when you were in that fret and you were the president of it and go, man, if I wasn't as smart as I am, that could have potentially happened. Are there ever any scenarios that go through your head where you think about that aspect? Well, you know, we, we were hazed. The hazing was different in, in the, the early 90s when I was in college. Uh, I'm sure it was in the 80s and it was in the 70s. Yeah. The advent of social media. The ability to instantly live stream a situation or a scenario, the ability to be able to talk or vocalize about something that happened has completely changed the dynamic, uh, in, at least in that context. Now, I'm not saying that the stuff that we did uh, you know, back when I was in, in college was, you know, you know non-hazing. I mean, you know, w it was a different time. Uh, but what happens now is you know, I think there's guys and girls drinking to uh, excess. Um, they are pushing the envelope of you know hurting each other, um, committing crimes, you know yeah. violating things. Uh, back then, for me at least, it was it was more good fun. You know, it was you know a, a time where it was a, a brotherhood. No one's trying to outdo anybody. And I think nowadays, I, I think that the generation of children that are now becoming adults and in college is it, – it's, it's a different dynamic, if that makes any sense. And I think when you look at movies and you look at social media and TV shows, there's this new character that comes to the idea of a frat boy. And I feel like that's what sort of sped things up is we're all sexed up and we're all hyper – as people in 2017, which is why I think these frat boys, when they come in at age 18, are trying to overcompensate. I think that's one of the big issues on each campus with these frats. Yeah, you know, and you know, my fraternity was great. I mean, we had a lot of guys that had great grades, uh, you know, a lot of scholarship uh, quality guys. Uh, it was an awesome brotherhood. I mean, look, you know, when we were at UCF, we had a brand new house. We moved from the ghetto on campus. And, and we had a brand new house. 
And we, we partied in this thing. You know, back then, you could have uh, kegs. You, you could have uh, beer. Yeah. Bring your own beer. You know, now, to some extent, my understanding is you can't have that type of thing you know, nowadays you know, as far as there's limitations. And again, it's a, a sign of the times. You know, things just, just change. Um, so I don't think there's a negative stigma from frats to the extent that it's not always like the movies. But then again, if you had this conversation with Bert, you know, I, I believe they burned down their frat house. <laughs> That's you. So, you know, if, if there's different contexts is that how that would apply depending on where you went to college. Now, is there a moment when you look back on being the president of the frat where you actually bonded with your brothers and it wasn't just getting drunk and getting laid and going crazy? Are there any moments that come to your mind, like let's say maybe you guys went camping or something, where you guys actually bonded and it was a real moment? Well, you know, I knew a lot of these guys for, for many, many years. You know, I lived, um, I was at UCF for five years and I lived in the fraternity house for four. And a lot of a lot of guys might live in the house for one year or one semester and then out. And that really is a testament to how much I love those guys. I was basically for my uh, sophomore, junior, senior and senior year. I, I again, I did five. Um, I was in the fraternity house. You know, so I think that it really speaks volumes on how much I wanted to be around the guys. I could have moved out at any time. You know, oh, you, had, you had to stay a year, I think, or a semester, a year or semester. Well, I can't remember. The, you had to be there for a part. Um, and then every year I just kept renewing, and I loved it. And uh, when you became president, you'd have to pay, if I remember correctly. Now, let's say 14 years down the road. I know it's weird to think about. What if Boozer, your son, yeah. comes up to you? And goes, Dad, I want to be in a frat. What would be your take? How would you handle that? Well, first I'd recommend ATO because he'd be a legacy. Uh, so he, That's if, a good point. If he goes, if he goes <laughs> and a guy says, look, my dad was uh, president of the uh, Ada Road chapter at University of Central Florida, you know, the, automatically they should hand him the pledge pin. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, 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 uh, how awesome it would be if he went to UCF or Florida or Florida State or Miami, yeah. you know, any, any one of the Florida schools really. Um, you know, but if he says to me, look, uh, dad, I want to join another fraternity. I think that, you know, these guys are, are better for me. You know, it, it's, he's going to have his own life to lead and I'm going to support him. And I, I think it's great. The bond that I made with a lot of those guys, I still have, uh, today. Now, when I was on the cruise, you had your kids there as well, and when you would bring them to eat, they were very well behaved. Even if they were hyper and a little bit loud, they were very cute and charming. So what I'm going to ask you is, what type of parent are you where even if the kids get, get a little rambunctious at times, how do you keep them maintained? What type of parent are you, would you say? Well, you got to have a lot of patience. You know, Dominic now is three and a half. Uh, Gabby is going to be six next month. Um, and... What I find is if they are separated, if I go you know, to dinner with one of them and then the other ones maybe with the grandparents or you know they're at, at school, wherever they are, it's much more calm and controlling. They egg each other on. So you have to watch how they interact with each other first. Yeah. Now, I'm an only child. I never had that dynamic. Me too. Now, my wife is the middle child of three sisters. Oh, so, so she has the opposite experience growing up than I do. Um, but if they start to get rambunctious, you know, I mean, y y y you don't want to yell at them in, in public, but, I mean, the, my children are loud by design anyway. Yeah. You know, and then again, I'm also loud, too. Yeah, you are. Uh, but you, gotta, you just got to tell them, you know, look, you got to you know, chill out. You got to calm down. And uh, there have been times that we had to leave the restaurant early, you know, that they're just misbehaving. They're jumping around. They're not listening. They have now ruined the dinner experience for that particular evening, and then we're out. I tell them, get in the car, tell my wife, go load them up, I pay the bill, and we're out. And then they don't get to finish their dinner, they don't get dessert. That, in essence, is a reprimand. What is that car ride home? Do you sort of ignore them? Do they have their bead headphones on, or do you try to scold them and teach them a lesson? It depends on the car. Uh, my wife has a um, TV system in her car that the kids can watch yeah. TV. Uh, I, I don't have that in my truck, uh, and, and that is by design. Uh, I, I like when they are in the car with me, they usually listen to the radio station, listen to Uncle Mike on 102.5, um, or, you know, they'll, they'll listen to their kid music that they have in the car. 
um, or they'll interact and talk to me. I don't like them to watch TV in the car. How great has Uncle Mike Kelta been to them? Mike is awesome. Um, Gabby has actually been on the radio with Mike a few times yeah. in studio and on location, and she sits right on his lap, and then they just have a, a blast on air. Um, she's actually logged more airtime than any um, kid her age I know. Boozer is um, uh, Mike and Amanda are the godparents to Dominic, which I affectionately called Boozer is his nickname. And they have been wonderful to have in our lives as godparents to Dom. And uh, I... I couldn't be happier or more thrilled when they accepted the invitation on Father's Day. We all went to a big dinner a few years ago on Father's Day, and that's when uh, Mike accepted the invite. How did you first meet Mike Helta? Um, I met Mike in 2009, uh, January or February. Uh, maybe it was maybe it was later. Coming right into the early spring. Um, I was brought into the station by a marketing rep that's no longer here. They knew me and my body of work that I did when I used to do a, a morning show on a 98 Rock. And they interviewed me for Mike's uh, show in the afternoon to have a lawyer with Mike. Now, Mike had only been in the afternoon for about a year. He had crossed over from the country station to 1025 in the afternoon. Back then, it was called the Cowhead Show. Yeah, And Mike admitted to me later on that he was apprehensive uh, in having a lawyer on. And not necessarily me, because he hadn't met me yet, but just having a lawyer on in general. He wasn't sure if it was going to work. But when he met me in the interview, and we did our first show together, which was Cinco de Mayo, May 5th of 2009, he knew right then and there that with our personalities and my interaction with him on the radio that it was going to work and this may be eight years we've been together. What are some of your favorite memories of being on the afternoon show and now the morning show with Mike? Oh my God, uh, Jesus! There, there are so many memories. The the holiday parties that we had, yeah. the drunky drunk parties. Um, I love to being on location. Uh, I love going out with uh, the fellas, you know, wherever they are. Whether it's at a bar, whether it's at a restaurant, um, those were some fun times when you did the, the location gigs. I love singing. I do cameos with Pitbull Toddler. Yeah. And uh, Mike, I'll never forget the first time I surprised Mike when I came out and sang Save a Horse, Ride a Cowboy. I don't think Mike knew I could sing to the extent that I kind of hold that type of tune with a certain, I don't sing well, I'm yeah. full disclosure, but there's a part of that song where you kind of like talk it and sing it at the same time. And I, I, Mike didn't realize that, A, I knew the words to the country song uh, as a lawyer, and then B, you know, actually can hang with the band. And I think that um, he realized that his lawyer was actually cool. Now, you're a busy guy. You're a lawyer, you're a husband, you're a radio host, you're a father, you're a friend to many people. How do you juggle it? Since you're like a jack of all trades when it comes to everything in life, how do you juggle it and maintain it? Uh, my wife asks the same question, um, <clears throat> which is interesting because I'm not quite sure how I manage to get through a day or a week. Um, yeah, I don't require a lot of sleep. I operate on a high uh, level of energy. So even if I'm tired or down or exhausted or stressed, you may not know it at all. That's still on? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm just checking. You're, you're looking at it. I'm thinking, uh, you know, so I, you know, I just kind of punch through what I've got to do in a day. And literally, I sometimes go hour to hour. Um, you know, that's how compressed my schedule is. And the, the reason why is I like to do things personally. If you're going to hire me, then you'll talk to me. You know, if you want to meet with me, then I'll meet with you. I am very hands-on, and I don't like to say no to people, and I don't like other people to do my work. I do it all. That's why I don't have any associate attorneys anymore. If people hire my office, I am your attorney. And a lot of people think that I have a large office and that I have several of associates who work for me. I don't. There's a, I work with other attorneys that own law firms that we co-counsel, but I don't have any associates. I'm on your case in one way or another. Now, for people that might be 
wanting to be a lawyer in life. What is your advice for them? What should they do? What should they think about when they go to school for it? What's it going to be like becoming a lawyer and things like that? Well, you know, when I went to law school um, in the late 90s and just around the turn of the century, um, there were a lot of uh, friends of mine in my class that were what you call non-traditional students. And these are folks that had other careers. Uh, one fellow was a race car driver. Another fellow worked for NASA. Another lady was a, a dental hygienist. And they decided to go get their law degree. Uh, so it, it, you can be of any age. You can be of any bad people that had political science majors, that had English majors that had scientific majors. You don't have to major in law to go to yeah. law school. You just want to be a lawyer. And then you have to have the LSAT scores and the grades to qualify to get in. Uh, so I would, to answer your question, I would encourage anybody to do it. There's a lot of people that go to law school, they get the JD, which is a Juris Doctor degree, just to have the knowledge, but don't actually practice. What do you think of that? Well, I think it's great because you can do that and parlay that into negotiations in your business, uh, contractual relationships that you have with your employees or your con your clients or contacts or however you operate your business model. I mean, you're legally trained. You know, you can't license you're not licensed to practice law unless you pass the bar, but you have the legal knowledge to deal with whatever whatever comes your way in your business or industry. Now, for people that haven't heard you on the Mike Kelta show and haven't heard your show on 102.5 The Bone, why should they tune in? Well, a lot of people would think a lawyer on the air is going to be boring. Um, you know, well, why the hell would I want to listen to a lawyer? Well, Florida Statute 243. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it kind of dry toast. My show is not designed that way. Um, I have a lot of guests that are very interactive from sitting judges to uh, law enforcement, to uh, attorneys, to doctors, to bail bonds agents, and private investigators, to sheriffs, to mayors. Anybody associated with the law has come on as a guest of my show. And it's half educational, and it's also half entertainment. You know, I mess with you a little bit, and then I give you the good style of legal advice, but I do it in a fun way where it's, it's captivating, you know, it's, it's, it's entertaining. But it's also providing a service to the community because I have to answer the questions accurately and honestly and legally. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't misguide folks. And it's tough to do in a 30-second bit or a 40-second question live on air without any dead time. But I've been doing this now for 10 years. I've been on radio and uh, on air in one way, shape, or form, and I absolutely love it. Now, for people that might be in some legal trouble and they're listening to the show right now, how can they get into contact with you? Well, the easiest thing to do is you can go to askthedom.com, which is just the catchy phrase for the website. Um, and then you can email me um, any question, and confidential, and I can email you back. Uh, you can call me through the website, and I have a 24-hour answering service, so my phone is never off, actually. Yeah. The phone's always on. Uh, you can always contact me directly at the office uh, at 813-251-5550. Uh, a lot of people tweet me at Ask the Dom, and in 140 characters, I give you a legal answer back. Well, Dom, keep up the good work. I love what you do on the air, and I love your approach to life and how you're a jack of all trades. So keep up the good work, and it's been a lot of fun having you on Happy Hour. Well, Happy, thank you very much. I appreciate your patience with my calendar and schedule. We, I, I told you I would do it, and I'm a man of my word. You are. And we did it tonight, and I'm here for you if you ever need anything, buddy. Sounds good. Thank you, Dom. All right. Thank you. Happy Hour. Happy Hour.